Hi everybody, Greg Yamako here with my company's Efficience and good to be with everybody with uh, within the Accelerators Organization group and uh, what uh, what I'm about, I guess, to give you a little bit of, of background given previous mentorship program conversations I've had. I have a software company, we do custom software development and we build quite a few of our own products that we partner with other people on SaaS applications, which is software as a service. And I have a team in India. I went to India in 2004, set up my own office over there, and have been doing custom development work. That was back kind of back in a little bit earlier days of the world that we live in now, which consists of a lot of mobile app development and e-commerce development and SaaS, which the company evolved into as the marketplace opened up in that in that world. Um, I've uh, done a lot of big projects for companies uh, as, as, as big as Coca-Cola and down to mom and shop type of businesses of helping them set up e-commerce and people starting out with a, the big idea to, to, to create something that they feel is special and big and, and will change the world within maybe a mobile app or, or some type of a other software as a service application. Well, I also have uh, a lot of experience with investments. I got an investment question here, so I'll give you a little background there. 20 years in the investment world. I set up my own mutual fund back in the 90s and rode that wave up to some nice success. And up into 2000, we had the number one growth and in income fund in the country for three and five years at that time. And, and uh, given what I was doing at that time with investing, I decided to uh, open up a world of, of opportunities within software because a lot of the research and, and the investment philosophy we had was about connectivity and investing in where things were going and I saw the future being software so when I sold the investment firm I that's when I got into the software company and opened up um, an office in India and, and have been doing software ever since. I love this space, I love doing what I'm doing, I love entrepreneurialism and, and running businesses so I've had quite a few We've had uh, a few successes and uh, quite a few failures along the way with different things that I've done. So a little bit of experience to share and, and let's get into the questions and, and see if there's a way to help others out there in the world. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, too, when I'm done because it's um, excited about this and passionate about what helping others can do for, uh, for us and for the contribution that we give when we do it. So first question is from uh, Stella. Stella asked, uh, I would like to know how to learn to delegate effectively. I am still struggling with letting go of tasks that someone else could do for me instead and save me time to focus on more important stuff. There are many articles that I've read on delegating and reading those did not bring me to any further as I am sure of what skills I do need to develop first. How do I lead myself? Hope that makes sense. Thanks for your time. Okay, Stella. Well, delegating is huge, and I've ran companies with uh, you know, like I've had uh, sixty employees with my software company at one time. It's not where it is now. I had ten here in the U.S. and and uh, fifty fifty five ish overseas in my India office. I've had my my investment firm. I had ten people there that worked uh, with us in the in the doing investment related research and other office work so delegation is huge because they say in the business world that it's better to work on your business instead of in your business and in your business being the the task that you may do if you are a shoemaker then instead of working on to grow and market your business uh, with shoes you are the one making the shoes or in software if you're a software person then you are the developer writing the code as opposed to doing the activities that are making the company better uh, for marketing and growth and strategic direction and culture building and so forth so to answer that, it's it's uh, delegating is challenging. Okay, I have learned to do it in in pieces. It took time for me to let go because I am the person that like wants to get it done and wants to make sure it gets done right. So having somebody else do it a lot of times is very uh, very hard to let go. I relate to your struggles here, 
And so it's a matter of getting it started with people. You got to bring in the right people. Okay. It, it's about hiring people and having those people that you have confidence in. And once you start there, you give a little bit and watch it get done. Realize that you can let go and get that feeling that when you let go, you got something will get accomplished. So it's a, it's a small one step type process that I would take to do this. And when you, um, when you make that happen, you will have the rewards of, of freeing up your own time and allowing yourself to engage in the more important task of, of running a business. So it's, it's, um, uh, maybe I'll come back to that a little bit with, um, with a couple of questions that kind of have relationships to that. So let's go to the next question. This is one is from, uh, Brianna, Brianna Carroll. I have a few people that are looking to collaborate with me and put on one-time marketing events between um, between our companies. We're looking at doing these collaborations, or when looking at doing these collaborations, how do I determine who does what and how much we, we do invest in, re, in the return on investment? How would you advise to start these conversations and are there any particular things I should look out for? Well, thing about this is I would probably go to the Stephen Covey philosophy or of um, uh, look for the end in mind or you know start out with with the end in mind and I would create a framework of what you want to get out of that collaboration okay what type of profitability are you looking for what type of benefit that you're offering each other within the uh, the ideas of what you're going to work together on. So what do you want to get out of it? What is the profit opportunity? What's the relationship? What's the co opportunities for marketing together? And when you build out those, those take those notes and build out that understanding of what you're looking for, then work backwards from there to having the discussions with the other, uh, the other parties and partners that you're looking to market with. So there's always opportunities to have uh, some type of, of uh, thoughts with the marketing space like what are the reasons for doing this is it because you're saving money together when you're when you're marketing uh, what are the other things that you're looking to accomplish and then get that uh, look for those outcomes and then go work backwards from there next question is flora sage flora ask um as I grow my business, I find I need more spiritual support and tools to keep working on myself and my own mindset. What apps, tools, and resources do you use as far as helping you support your spiritual side of growing a business? Thank you for your time, Flora. Well, very interesting question because I have spent a lot of time in this space. I actually uh, got a what would be called a success coach back in uh, around 2000. And started working with this person I achieved a lot of success at that time and was still felt like there was something missing and so when um, I I guess I was looking and when I was looking the, the teacher appeared and I found a coach that I worked with that helped me a lot I did weekly calls with that coach and from there I developed a, um, a an approach to life where uh, my morning start out with somewhat of a yoga -ish type stretching routine that I do in the morning and then I do some breathing exercises that um, allow for me opening up into awakened connection and so forth. Those things that people will call meditation, they'll call it just being peaceful, being mindful, and so forth. And I found that when I do that first thing in the morning, then the things that get thrown at me throughout the day are not as, um, don't feel as chaotic. It, uh, it creates a peacefulness that allows me to breathe through the difficulties and, and make um, make better decisions I think when you feel more grounded and, and, and in that type of space uh, a couple things that I could recommend would be um, uh, the prosperity paradigm by Steve Denunzio is a good book that helps to open up your mindset around business and making money along with the spiritual side of things um, another book that was resonated significantly with me was conversations with God and there's a there's a section in the book about having to um, talk about looking at money and looking at money and, and so forth from a from a more of a spiritual perspective and how not to push it away a lot of times in life we push money away from us by 
thinking that something's wrong with having it and not allowing that abundance to flow into our lives. So um, again, just taking that morning, uh, setting up some type of routine when you start your day. It may be a different time for some people, but it works best for me in the mornings where I can uh, get outside a little bit, uh, feel the, the sun, and, and be a part of somewhat, whether it's a walk or just being out on my balcony, uh, overlooking water or some type of scenic environment and, and taking that time. Something else that I've used is what's called a mind movie. And it's actually, I think it's mindmovie.com, um, that you create pictures of what you want in your life and you put music and stuff to it. And when you have a, a mind-heart connection by watching the movie, it helps to attract things into your life that you're looking to obtain. So personal, uh, spiritual, and financial. So it's, it's, uh, it's an excellent tool. Also, I would consider looking, uh, Peter Sage is a... Uh, a coach out there that teaches a lot of this a lot in this space around the financial spiritual side of things also and somebody I've been following and, and watching his um, program uh, and so just look up Peter Sage and the type of uh, he's got different coaching programs and videos that you can watch around what he's doing let's go to the next question okay this is from Eric Eric said our company offers a free estimate. Every once in a while, we get a client that isn't there on time to reschedule last um, or reschedules last minute. Our average service costs, costs about $1,200. This takes away the opportunity for us to make a sale to another client as we are booked out. What are our options? Do we give a 48-hour cancellation policy um, and charge $150 for the, for the next estimate date? If no show, then credit the $150 if they go out if they go with our service or implement something different. Any suggestions appreciated? Well, Eric, I don't have a lot of experience in that space. Um, it's always been frustrating, frustrating in business to be, to whether it's scheduling appointments to meet with somebody, they don't show up, they're not there, doing like RFPs, which I don't do anymore because of the chaos around doing an RFP, but some people live in that space and it's a lot of work goes into doing an RFP and you put them out there and a lot of times uh, people are responding to RFPs in the sense of that people are just getting, they already know who they're going to go with, but they have to get the appropriate number of, of uh, responses so that they can meet some quota that they have to approve to the higher ups. And so it's very frustrating that when people put in a lot of work like that, they don't get a return on it. It is, in one sense, it is a part of doing business. So there are a few things that you can do. Charging money for, your, for the appointment is a way to give yourself a little bit more respect. So it may be a trial and I would say probably a trial and error approach to, put, to implementing something like that. I would... I would start it out with a reasonable amount of money that you don't feel is going to be too um, much. But if people are willing to, when you say people, when you talk to people and they pay that amount of money, you know that they're giving you a little bit more respect for their time. And also maybe put a cancellation on it like you, like you were thinking, um, that if they cancel within this amount of time, then you, they're not charged. But um, I've seen more offices, uh, doctor's offices doing some stuff in this regard and uh, and other people doing it too. So I think it's becoming more acceptable to the community and I would um, I'd definitely consider that option. Um, it's probably the, the one that will give you the most effect on making sure that your, your calendar is booked and that you're optimizing your time. Um, I would look for, um, I guess making sure that uh, that the numbers you put out are not, if you're starting to get a lot of deterrence from people actually booking appointments, then maybe your number's too high. So start out with a number, I don't know if 150 is the right number, I'd probably start out a little bit lower, but it's gonna be uh, dependent on maybe doing a survey to some of your clients, asking them, hey, what would you think about this? If I was if I was in charge of fee to do this, would you feel comfortable with that? So start with a survey, give a little market, feedback 
it's always great to go out and go to the marketplace and, and get some feel. So talk to your, some of your best clients that you used in the past, telling them you're having this problem and get some market research in play to uh, figure out the appropriate numbers that will help you. Okay, next question. Uh, Kimberly, Kimberly Porter said, I have, I value putting out quality product service, but would say, would you say quality is better than quantity? And uh, when getting to the first million, which is king, uh, quality or quantity? Well, <laughs> that that is the million dollar question um, in a lot of regards. But I would, uh, a lot of times the way I've looked at this with products that I've created and put out, I have tried, uh, there's always something you can do to make a particular product or service better. And you can spend an endless amount of times digging in and looking at what you're doing, how you're doing it, what could be better, and you spin and spin and spin, and the um, it's better from like what I was just saying before is market feedback. So when you can put something out there, Seth got, uh, got in, uh, the wrote, uh, 20 different marketing books and he's a famous marketing guru and he's always said is to uh, uh, get it get it launched get it out there and when he says that he's saying that it's never going to be never going to be perfect so it's a matter of getting it out in the marketplace and let the marketplace tell you what you really uh, how they want you to perfect this product so as long as it doesn't have lots of bugs, it's going to make you look, uh, uh, diminish your reputation, make you look like you don't know what you're doing, then the quality of the product is uh, relative to that, okay? It's relative to making sure that you meet some minimal market standards, that it works and it's acceptable. From a software perspective, where I come from, it means that would mean like not having a lot of bugs in it, that you actually go through a process of, of uh, buying the product or checking in signing into a site that you get access to it that you can have a forgotten password type situation that you can move on and on so that you uh, you can flow through the system you can actually check out of a system and and so on and so forth that you're not going to have a lot of flaws in it now does that process flow as optimally as is, is, is possible maybe not so the marketplace can give you that feedback to make those adjustments so it's a matter of the quantity, I guess, the quality of the product is um, is important to the degree that it doesn't make you look bad in the marketplace. But it doesn't have to have everything. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. And uh, as far as quantity, I mean, that can be measured in in the form of inventory and so forth. In some situations, where do you have enough of the quantity to ship out if you get a lot of orders? Does it going to delay you if you have to uh, get from the manufacturer and it's going to take a week or two and it's going to delay your interaction with some of your uh, some of your customers because they're not getting it on a timely fashion as they would expect? So that has to be uh, looked at and it's let the market start getting you orders. Once you get orders, then you can start dealing with the circumstances around it. But again. I would say um, utilize the marketplace to, to perfect your products and services, but at least meet a minimal level of quality that doesn't affect your reputation in some negative way. Next question, Kimberly Porter um, asks, uh, what are a few low cost investments that have big returns? I'm limited in funds and want the best bang for my buck. Well, Kimberly, this is a uh, that is a big long discussion around this question because a lot of things matter relative to somebody's risk preferences, time horizons, and so on. When you're talking investments and you're talking the the type of investments, so I'll give you some generalities that may help you out. If you do have a longer time horizon and you want you don't have a lot of funds, then I would consider putting money into an area of uh, some type of mutual fund. A mutual fund that's going to be low cost and that it doesn't have a lot of upfront sales charges. It, uh, you could use some different type of index funds like say the Vanguard 500 index or a variety of other ones that are very low. Uh, there's no front end cost to get in and the annual maintenance fees or the annual charges that they, they place in the fund to run them are significantly low. Um, 
I mean, like, if you understand basis points, that's a percentage that is like some of these funds can be at 0 0.10 of a percent that they charge to manage those funds. That m means more of your money is going to work for you and less is being taken out in expenses to run the fund. So the other thing to do is the dollar cost averaging, okay, where you put money in on a regular monthly basis. That way you're not trying to time the market. Nobody can time the market. It's high. It's been high for the uh, past couple of years. It keeps going up, and we don't know when it's going to come down. And so by taking a monthly sum and setting that aside every month over a long period of time, you're going to buy in. You're going to buy less shares when the market's high because you're putting in the same amount. If the share price is higher, then you're going to get less shares. When the share when the uh, market goes down and you're putting in that dollar amount, you're going to get more shares. So you're going to buy. Um, you're going to average with what they call dollar cost averaging your shares over a period of time that are going to be lower and you are going to be getting your money in without the worry of trying to pick timing, which a lot of times that can hold people back from actually making an investment, and then they, they'll never get a return on their money. So um, to get the biggest bang, some type of equity fund that is spread around a portfolio using maybe an index. You can use an, an index that is in the S&P 500. You can use an index of large cap stocks. You can use an index of foreign um, you know, or, or globally traded international stocks. So there's different things you can look at and that's really depending on your preference. But a mutual fund is a, a good way to create diversity for low dollars and allow it to be done at a low cost also for maximizing your returns. Nobody knows what the market's gonna do going forward. And you don't wanna use stocks if you're like a few ways, a few years away from retirement too, unless you're using just high individual stocks that are paying you income, that you invest in those companies because they're solid and they pay out a good dividend income and then will send you quarterly checks that will supplement your income uh, is, is one way to look at that if you're close to retirement. If you're not, you have a long time before, you long time horizon to grow your money, I would put it into a good stock mutual fund. Next question, uh, let's see, Jamie asks, how can I become a better leader? one that everyone wants to follow and listen to, and one that attracts the perfect candidate into my company. What resources would you recommend? So to be a better leader, it comes down to listening to what your people are about, okay? And a lot of us entrepreneurs are kind of afflicted with the ADD, dyslexic type of uh, syndrome that is is you'll find a co that commonality within an entrepreneurial type of um, person and I don't know what the reason is but it, it's already it's been proven that it's three to four times the average in the entrepreneurial space have ADD or dyslexic type of mindsets so um, Listening is important because the ADDs where, where come, people come into our office and you're talking to us and we're like, yeah, 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 but you're not really listening. And that, that lack of engagement is a way to turn off our employees. I've, I've done it before. It's definitely happened to me. I'm, a, I'm dyslexic. And so I see things in like patterns and uh, listening to words that, are not, that I can't visualize has, uh, has always been a struggle. So I can relate to people out there that have those mindsets and are distracted a lot and look at the big picture and think big ideas. And a lot of times you're not focused on your people and their thinking. So one of the key things you can do as a leader is to build a culture. Now all companies have a culture. It's just a matter if you determined what that culture is or you let it evolve um, organically and on its own, which may be a culture that is not attractive to what you want to ultimately accomplish. Uh, key, there's key things out there about, um, about culture. You can look up Jim Collins, and he's written some papers about building a culture and how to um, create core values, create a core purpose, create a BHAG. Uh, that is BAG is a big, hairy, audacious goal. So if you want to have a team of people that want to, that you want to follow, then you got to give them a purpose and you got to give them a direction. And you give people a direction, something that's bigger than them, bigger than um, uh, what they are trying to do individually, and you get you create a sense of accomplishment and, and a team that are all working together to this one um, ideological or um, 
goal that you've put out there. So if you remember, um, those that can remember, go back from history and remember that John F. Kennedy's idea of putting a man on the moon when he said made the speech in 61 or 62 by the end of the decade, which would have been 1970, we actually, he was uh, assassinated and gone shortly after he said that. But that idea he put out rallied a whole country around coming together and putting a man on the moon, which we landed a man on the moon in 1969. So he created this big, hairy, audacious goal. And he, even when he wasn't there, that goal synergized and energize people to work hard and bring something together that was was um, very big and out there and 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 in a lot of minds wasn't possible so the culture will come from a positive culture will come from those ideas of putting something that's big uh, big that is a part of a purpose that connects their not only their mind but their heart as I was talking before, when you when you align both your high, your mind and your heart, you can work towards the bigger vision of what you want to accomplish and a sense of um, putting out that right vibration out there in the world that attracts things to you. So, um, other things about that, um, actually, in the near future, I'm working on something with this empathetic listening. I've partnered with Eric Maddox, who is the guy who caught Saddam Hussein, and he did it he, he was the interrogator for the military that caught him and he did it without waterboarding he did it through empathetic listening so by listening to the enemy he was able to he was able to ex get them to tell and share information by just listening to them and focusing on them and he did this when he was talking in, and they weren't talking the same language he had an interpreter and he was able to get people to open up and when you listen to people and you have an idea of where they are and what they are wanting to do, one of the most important human needs is to be heard. And when you can uh, communicate with people in a way that you're really listening to them, and, 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 and I struggle with this significantly. So I was attracted to Eric and what he's doing, and together we're putting out a set of videos that will teach people how to be uh, better empathetic listeners. And i uh, excited about that, but just that's one, uh, that'll be a future tool that you may be able to consider using. But uh, those, uh, those things that I talked about of culture, having a purpose and so forth allows a leader to come together and be uh, be organized in a way that helps them to be uh, get, achieve the objectives that they want to achieve and be the person they want to achieve. One other thing I'll add to that is um, having a process, an operating system within your company. Okay, there's different types of like, you know, the software that we use, Microsoft, um, Windows 95 created an operating system that allowed for people to be able to um, have access to data, move data around, share data, and so forth that changed the whole dynamic of the world. Businesses need an operating system too. When you have a good operating system, that's going to allow your interaction with your team and the culture you have to be better. So a couple of, of, of operating systems out there are the Rockefeller Habits, uh, Vern Harnish's Rockefeller Habits, or, and one of his books, Rockefeller Habits and Scaling Up. And then there's um, the, the Traction Model, or EOS, that talks about uh, operating a business and having the right routines of, of daily meetings, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, working toward your BHAG, your Big Hairy Audacious Goal. So that's just uh, another avenue that when you have a appropriate operating system will allow for you to, to um, um, your people around you to be inspired and feel good about the processes that you have in place to make your, to make your culture good. Okay, so next question here. Uh, okay, this is Stella. And okay, so we're back to the beginning here from our question. So that was our last question uh, of the day. And I will, I will um, sign off by saying that uh, what you guys are doing here within the accelerators organization is is hugely attractive having a peer group that you can work with and you can have the ability to um, share information put out your needs put out your issues and get this community feedback is powerful remember when I was saying earlier about the market market research and market feedback when the marketplace is smarter than any of us 
and uh, the marketplace is going to tell us positive things uh, or tell us the things that we need to know that, to make our products and services better and to, to put us on a positive trajectory. So having a group like this is also the same. I've been in Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, since 1999, and it's been life-changing for me. The people I've been around, the, my forum that I've been in for the past 20 years has been um, significant in making my life better and to making and keeping me out of trouble in business and help me get out of trouble when I, in my business. So uh, surrounding yourselves with the appropriate peer group is huge. AO is about that. EO is about that. So I um, highly, I love sharing in this space because it's, it's, it's what we do when we're in the entrepreneurial forum. We, we put out ideas or issues that we have and we discuss them and share. And we all learn from that. You know, no matter whoever has the issue and what they're talking about, we all get to come out of that meeting with uh, some sense of understanding about the experiences that other, pe other people have had to help take away some potential um, strain, struggles, pains that we could run into by not allowing ourselves to be open to these type of um, uh, sharing experiences. So good luck with your business. Uh, look forward to sharing more in the future. Any questions about this, please uh, post and I look forward to responding and, and helping in any way. Till next time. Take care.